When you say that um, with the cash settlement you should have a scope of works and you should have that um, as, as the basis of your shopping list, should you have the design, uh, can you expect that the design will have been also sorted out for you or is that where you would go off to, and when I say the design, say for instance you're doing a repair and you might have, um, I don't know, a couple of walls to be taken out or brick walls to be taken out within a, within a, a plaster finish, that sort of thing, would you be expecting that to address any structural issues as well, so that you've actually got a level of detail that you can work on? I think you'll find that in the documentation they have to be able to provide the rationale for the work that's being done. So if they are actually going to take down structural walls, you would absolutely expect them to have some <coughs> engineering input in the cash settlement documentation that says it required this level of attention. So I would think that when you get the cash settlement, not that I've ever seen any of them, you should be getting at least the shopping list, the reason, the why, for the what, right? And, and that why is really important because it also means that when you talk to the builders, they're going to ask you why. Another question related to that is often um, on the scope of works there'll be provisional sums and that's because they're not quite sure until they actually get into the work what's going to be involved. So for example under the floor they think well we're not sure how many piles need repaired, replacing etc etc. Mm -hmm. Yet they still want to go ahead mm -hmm. and cash settle. Mm -hmm. So I guess my question really is how do you work out how to cover unknowns? Well, the provisional sum is exactly the way to do it, right? Um, you would expect that, um, for example, uh, maybe they haven't done um, all the foundation design, but they know it's a TC3 foundation, and they know that they run at around $78,000 premium on a standard um, uh, foundation. So they should be able to say to you, look, a provisional sum in here of um, 78000 is appropriate um, for the additional work that's required that we haven't actually scoped sufficiently. Now on top of that 78, we think that because we don't want you to come back, that we should add another 20,000 um, to make it right. So let's make it around 100,000 and make that the provisional sum. Now the, the, the claimant might say, okay, look, I can live with that, but will I be able to come back if it goes outside of that region? And normally the insurer will say yes to that. Um, and that is worth uh, that extra little bit of guarantee all the time knowing that it's unlikely because they've actually provisioned for it. Does that make sense? Yeah, I guess it will depend on how unknown the unknowns are. Absolutely, and I, and I think you can't cash settle if the unknowns are really unknown. Like, it, like um, you know, they, they say, okay, this house needs um, completely repiling, um, there's liquefaction around it, um, and the house is on a rubble foundation, and we want um, the roof replaced at the same time. Um, here's 200,000. It's just not going to work, is it? Um, so again, that shopping list, and I keep going, because I'm expecting the shopping list to be a quite a long list um, of things because I, that's where it's going to go. When you get to the builder, he's going to ask, well, how much floor, how much tiling, how many piles, how much wall, you know? Um, and so on the, out of the cash settlement stuff, we should be getting something that's starting to say that much wall, that much, that, that much, that much, and that much. But I, I did caution that you must check those volumes because 12 square meters can be two in this corner and two in that corner and that's different from 12 square meters together and the price will be different so when you're settling with the insurance company you need to be thinking about there's a premium for five different work phases so what you're really saying when it's a repair you have to be fairly clear on the ex the, I'm talking about underfloor where you can't see it, you actually have to be fairly clear as to how many piles are going to be replaced or you can't leave it as an unknown 
really we, when you're cash settling? You, you can leave it as an unknown, but you would have to be saying um, in the cash settlement there are 50% to be replaced and we're pricing for the 50%. We'll make an allowance for it being more than that because you need to know what that quantity is because you don't know when the guy goes under the floor and he finds that it's 82% of the piles whether the provisional sum was meant to cover it or not meant to cover it. So you don't know whether it's your owner's risk or the, the, the insurer's risk. So you need so to have certainty there. You need to have enough certainty yeah. To, yeah. to take it over the threshold, yeah. right? You don't need to be absolutely certain, but you need to be close enough. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to scale the job. You know, if, the, if they come and they say everything is kind of provisional, but we're not quite sure, then when you get the build around to have a look, his price is going to be in a provisional and I'm not quite sure. And so from then on, it's going to be one long argument. Um, so it's important to get that bit done. And it might mean that the owner actually has to do some investigative work before they take the builder on. They'll get a better price. Um, so William, I guess that flows on to a question of how detailed does the cash settlement information have to be? If you're replacing the house, obviously it can be one lump sum, right? That lump sum needs, though, to be described enough. You need to know whether all the landscaping's in, the driveways, all the, all the stuff around the perimeter of the house, the fencing, the washing line. I mean, you've got to get down to quite a lot of detail about what's included in the lump sum, right? But you, but you could accept it as one um, figure. If you're doing repair work, which is, say, uh, 100,000, so it's got six or seven different facets to it, you would expect the six or seven different facets to have enough description on them that you can say, ah oh, yes, definitely that work needs doing and we need that tradesman and we expect it to be around that cost, right? You can't do a lump sum for a $100,000 uh, settlement where they're going to take the walls down and you're not quite sure what's behind them, for example. Does that make sense? Yes, perfect. Any other questions? I've got Thank one you. on the building contract. Yes. So what's yes. the usual practice for building contracts? Are they usually for a fixed price or are they prices subject to adjustment? They're usually prices adjustment to, uh, subject to adjustment mm -hmm. because, um, and that's why you would have the schedule. So we, we, you can do a, what's called a lump sum contract which is kind of what you might do with the um, design build organisation, right? Um, but um, as soon as there's any changes that fall outside what they think the lump sum was, then you would get a claim, right? So you haven't actually got a lump sum because then you've got an argument about money after it. So the sensible thing to do is to have a schedule of prices, and we call that a schedule. You could go as far as a schedule of rates contract. So schedule of prices gives you a chance to control within the sum of money what's being done. A schedule of rates contract involves remeasure. So then you would go and you'd say there's 12 square metres, it's done 13, so 12 square metres at $10, now it's 13 square metres at 10, so he's due the extra money. Now that is more unusual for a building contract because it's usually about big quantities, but having the schedule there with a price against it means that if you end up doing two or three changes, you can usually find something that's reasonably applicable. So in the schedule or specifications, I think it is, that I've been seeing, there's usually the, um, the work that's been done and then alongside that should be the prices and the rates, quantities. Yeah. Okay. Yep, that's, that's, that's good practice. Yeah. Mm. But you wouldn't give that price to the builder when you sent it out for pricing. You'd send them the schedule with the measure, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. The quantity, mm -hmm. but not the price, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Because remember, he's competitively tendering it, mm -hmm. so he's got some control on what he puts in yeah. that space. Once the builder's filled in the price, is it, is it still subject to adjustment? The price, mm -hmm. uh, well, well, no, not really, because what you're doing is you're taking his package. 
So if, if he sums his whole package up yeah. and it comes to, I don't know, just inside your budget, mm -hmm. then you, you, got to, you might look through the prices and say, God, look, he's got all his money stacked on that one pile that needs replacing. Mm -hmm. And um, actually, we don't know till we open the floor and it might be four of them and then I'll be in for $40,000 a pile. Um, if we change the piles, because he's going to use that line when he says, oh, there's another pile needs replacing, right? So the, the, you need the schedule to look reasonably realistic in the way it's done, right? Mm -hmm. But you can, you can leave him to choose that because one contractor may have a really good, sharp electrician's price, so all his electrical prices will be quite low, but, and his building prices will be normal, and that's what's made him the best price. If you say to him, but it's, you know, I've got $60 for that, and you've only got $40, um, then you're going to bring back up those other prices in the process. So the thing is to know how much the overall job's going to cost and make sure it's a bit realistic. So just on that line item, so if you've got, if you're pricing it, um, replacement of foundations, and you've got an unknown number, would you do it? How do, how do you do it so it's not, not every time he replaces a pile, it's that specific? I think what you do is you go to a provisional sum. So you'd say the pr provisional sum for all the foundation okay. work, and under the provisional sum, we have anticipated a total cost of 20 or whatever it is. Yeah. Um, not go down into the numbers that you've used to generate your 20,000. Okay. Because if you put the numbers in, then, then they will be cut. So they might make on it, or they might not. Oh. Uh, no, no, you don't put the, if you don't put the number in, they, 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 when you do the provisional sum, you have, subsequently to agree a price, right? right? Yeah. So if he gets under the house and there's nothing to do, yeah. then you're likely to be zero, mm -hmm. and he doesn't get that 20,000. Yeah. But if he goes under the house and everything needs replacing and it's 40,000, yeah. then you've got to pay him the 40,000, yeah. right? 